So many designers are adding the ability to become data visualization designers to their skill set. Are you falling behind? Is this skill set even necessary for you? And if so, where do you start? My guest today is the self made data viz expert and host of the Data Viz Today podcast. Her name is Allie Torben. In this episode, Allie shares her three core concepts for getting started in data viz design. These were based off the things that she learned over the years and wish she would have known when she got started. Give it a listen and let me know what you think. All right, let's go ahead and do this. Allie Torben, thank you so much for coming and joining me on the Design Today podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Dylan. I'm excited to be here. You have been extremely kind to me. I appreciate uh, some of our interactions that we've had on, on Twitter and, and whatnot. And uh, it was a, a cool opportunity for me to say like, you know what, here's a, a, an expert who knows what they're doing. I need to get them on the show. <laughs> and uh, there's a, a very straightforward topic for us to be talking about. So I'm excited to get to it. Um, so Ali, go ahead and share with us a little bit about what you're up to and how you got into data viz, because this is a cool topic that uh, I think we can really dig deep into. Uh, I've only done one podcast that really focused on data viz, and it was through a mutual friend of ours. Mm -hmm. And so I'm excited to be able to come back to this topic and get some more insights. So tell me how you got into data viz. Let's see. So I'm a data viz designer at the American Enterprise Institute in Washington, D.C., and I've been doing that for almost a year now. But before that, I was more of a software tester data analyst um, for government clients. And I kind of just fell into that after college. I was a math major. And, you know, right when you graduate, you just get a job, wherever, whoever will hire you. Sure. This is 2008, too, so I couldn't be too picky. Um, sure. But it was a great job. I met my husband there. I'm, uh, I learned how to work with clients. And then I started having kids, and I stopped working. And I thought, at first I thought, okay, well, I'm pausing my career. This is going to be, this is, you know, a sacrifice. Um, but then mm -hmm. I thought, well, maybe this could be a chance for me to pivot into something that I actually like better. And so I was trying to think, well, what exactly would that be? And I started just Googling like freelance stuff you can do from home data analyst. And I came across data journalism. But yeah. I realized doing data journalism freelance is pretty tough because it's a lot of work. I mean, you have to find a story, you have to find data, you have to visualize it, and then you have to write about it. So doing that freelance, it wasn't very sustainable. But then I realized that the part that I actually liked the most is the ending part where you're visualizing the data. So I decided that that would be a good career path for me to pursue. But I had no background in data viz. I had no training. Right. I mean, I was a math major, but I mean, we just did graphs for, you know, utility, not really for communication, really. Sure. So I thought the best way for me to learn data viz was to start a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Most people would say, so, listen to a podcast, but you just dove right yeah. in and said, I'm going to start one. <laughs> well, I mean, I did listen to a lot of uh, data viz podcasts. Well, there's not really many out there, but I did listen to the ones out there, but I was missing, I I just, you know, a lot of them were interview shows and I wanted one that focused on um, like dissecting a chart. Like why was this chart so good? Like how could I replicate it? And that's what I wanted to do. So my episodes are really short and I just pick one visualization and I reach out to the designer and I ask them like, what was their inspiration and um, why they chose to visualize it this way. Mm -hmm. And then I create my own inspired viz um, based on what they did. And so it was this great, um, amazing uh, combination of learning from people. I like turn these people into my mentors and um, created a portfolio for myself. And then when I had more freedom and more time, my daughter started preschool. I had more time and I got a part-time job as a data visit designer. So yeah, that's, that's awesome. <laughs> where I am today. So let me pause and go back a little bit. You said you took time off from what you were doing. You had kids. How many kids do you have? 
I have two. So I was okay. working part time from home at the old job with my first uh -huh. daughter. And then when I had my second daughter, it was, you know, too much to keep working at the same time. So sure. I stopped. I stopped completely working completely for about a year. And um, then I started feeling like, OK, I think I might be able to I get back into something. Yeah. Like I let's start figuring out what my next move is going to be when I start having more time. And that's when I yeah. started doing the podcast. No, and I love that. And the reason I just wanted to go back to that is because, I mean, you had taken time away from the whole professional world mm -hmm. and now you're just jumping right back into it. Mm -hmm. And obviously that was a while ago, but I think it's impressive because a lot of people are just kind of really focused on like, I got to pick career, I got to pick family. And I think it's really cool that you were able to say, no, I can do both. Yeah. And it, I think it all shifted when I found my um, pausing, I found that as a gift rather than something a sacrifice sure and there's actually a book called work pause thrive which i read you know it's about women who are working and then they pause to you know raise children and then they pivot and a lot of times can really find their passion if they really utilize that time that's awesome i appreciate you sharing that i need to check that out mm -hmm. so how long ago was it that you got back into the workforce then uh let's see so i was kind of doing part-time work starting 2017. My second daughter was born 2015. So, and then I took a year off. And so 2015, I was kind of doing some off and on work. And then at AEI where it's like, you know, salary position, yeah. even though I'm still working part-time, it's a salary position. It's not like um, I'm getting just a little bit of work here and there. I work about 25 hours a week and um, that's been going on for almost a year. That's awesome. And the podcast has been going on how long? Yeah, uh, let's see. Um, March to March was a year, so maybe a year and a half, about a year and a half. Almost. Congratulations. That's a good milestone yeah. to have. <laughs> yeah. So you've got extensive background in data visualization and completely, I mean, can we say self-taught? Is that accurate? Yes. Yeah. Completely self-taught. Mm -hmm. What, I mean, we're getting into some of these key concepts that you've pulled out over the last little while about what, uh, it, creates the good foundation for data visualization, but what resources were, were you going to, to get, I guess, your inspiration? What were you doing to, to teach yourself? Um, well, definitely using the podcast. And then also, um, I was, uh, there's a couple books that I really like Nathan Yao's data points. Um, I think that's a great one because he just really breaks down, um, the, best parts of visualization, like the different encodings that you can use, like what is geospatial data, you know, it just gives you kind of the vocabulary of what what people are talking about when they talk about data visualization. Sure. And then and then I practiced, I feel like there is really no better way to get better at something than to just to just practice and the beginning yep. is is not going to be good. And <laughs> I have a ton of very embarrassing charts, but there's just <laughs> no way to um, to get better than than to practice. And that was my number one way of using those inspired visualizations that I did for the podcast as a way to be like, OK, well, today I'm focusing uh, on annotations. So yep. what did this person do that was so smart in the way that they annotated? And then now I'm going to create a part a chart and really focus on my annotations. And that's, that's really, that's really the biggest thing that I did was, um, was practice, find some inspiration, study it out, mm -hmm. and then try and apply it for yourself. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yep, exactly. So over the last couple of years, then let's get into uh, really some of these concepts. I know you highlighted three core concepts. Uh, why mm -hmm. don't you go ahead and take me through a couple of them and, and then we'll kind of pause and get some clarification as we need. Yeah, I think that if I were to go back and tell myself at the beginning <laughs> some some hard one advice is yeah. the first thing is, you know, a lot of people, including myself, think data viz is creating a chart is really just about creating the chart. You have data, you put it in Excel, click a few buttons, whatever the default is, whatever, and take it away. Yep. And that's pretty much all there is to it. But really, it's a process, just like UX design. I mean, it's a process. You start with um, your, you know, defining your goal, and you have a certain number of things you've got to go through. And you've got to do some testing and then, um, and then have your final product. And just understanding that it's a process is a big thing. And the first thing that I like to do is to ask my clients to 
um, create a focus sentence. And it kind of sounds, I'm sure I would have thought at the beginning that this was like a throwaway step, <laughs> you know, sure. focus sentence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, are, we, all, we all know what the goal is, whatever. Yeah. But seriously, like writing down what the focus is, because a lot of, I have found a lot of my clients either they just dump a bunch of data and be like, just show it all. You know, I, we just, I have all this data, just show it all. But I, your audience is not going to understand what's happening because they don't uh -huh. know the data as well as you do. So uh -huh. if you just throw everything out that out there and you have no focus, they're not going to understand. Or sometimes I've had people come and say, I want this, this, and this, but it's not really um, exactly what they want. So asking them to just write in one sentence what their goal is, is very helpful. Um, and the best part about writing out a focus sentence is that you can kind of hold them accountable later on when they want to change something. Sure. And also yourself as you're creating it, you'd be like, okay, is this, let me double check. Is this satisfying the focus sentence that, that we first decided on? And when it comes to writing these focus sentences, are, are they just goals or what, I mean, what goes into writing a, a focus sentence? What I like to do is, you know, just keep it very simple and just say, like we, we talk and they have requirements and we, we, I see their data. And then I just ask them at the end, like, okay, what's the one thing that if your audience got from your chart, you would be happy? Yeah. Like, what's the one thing they could take away? And you'd be like, yes, like this chart did what I wanted to do. And just by getting them to just give me one thing, it kind of gives them permission to not get bogged down in all of their data and just be like, you know, just really laser focus on what, um, what's important to them. Is there a formula for that sentence or do you have an example of a sentence you could share? Yeah, I, um, so obviously I'm a podcaster, so I'm really yeah. into podcasting. So I'm actually reading this book, which you might be interested in. It's called Out on a Wire with Jessica okay. Abel. And okay. she is a, um, she, I think she's a podcaster and she wanted to know how people like at NPR are put together their data story or their um, audio stories. Uh -huh. And so she interviewed great radio audio storytellers and tried to figure out how they're putting together these amazing stories, like this American life, cool. like all the best podcasts. So it's so full of great advice. But one of the biggest things that I took away because I could use it in my work was this thing that they use called a focus sentence where they're pitching ideas to each other. You know, they get one glimmer of a story and then they pitch it to each other and they try to figure out, could this actually be an episode mm. of of this Amer this great a uh, great American life. This, yeah. And um what their formula is is um someone does something because some motive but some conflict. Ah. So someone does something because but and um it really helps you focus on where your characters kind of how they're moving and um what their motive is like what's keeping them moving forward yeah. and also what could get in their way and it's just a, a quick and easy sentence but it really helps you um figure out where where your chart might need to focus and i feel like the conflict part is usually where it ends up needing to focus and i actually used this the other day because the Data Visualization Society has this yearly survey mm -hmm. where they survey database practitioners. And um, I wanted to create a visualization out of it, but I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to visualize. So I thought, well, maybe I can create a focus sentence for it and try to focus myself. And I knew I wanted it to kind of be helpful to people who are just starting to get into data visualization. Um, so I was trying to think of the problems that they come up against because I actually came up across these problems when I first, um, not too long ago. So my focus sentence was um, data viz practitioners are looking for data viz jobs uh, because they want, to, they have a certain set of skills that they want to use, but they don't always know which particular industries or roles are right fit for their skills. And it just, a very easy sentence, Love it. but that last part, you know, they don't know where their skills fit into industries and roles. That was perfect. So I use that. And there's a whole bunch of data in the survey about, 
you know, what your job is, what, like, are you an analyst? Are you academic? Are you a journalist? And then what your organization is, private sector, nonprofit, whatever. So I just made a matrix of, you know, how these people in the academic journalism, you know, like all those different um, combinations, like how those people are saying that they're spending their time. Are they spending time on design, um, data science, data prep, data cleaning? So you could see you, very easily, these are, they're just bar charts. You can just easily see, oh, if I wanted to be a journalist, you know, how much time am I kind of be spending on data cleaning or design? Is that what fits my skills? Yep. So that's where a focus sentence really helped. Well, and I feel like you're setting up your, your set your step two in this process while mm -hmm. you're describing that story. Uh, you had mentioned that you're using your focus sentence now to select your chart type. So explain how that process then works for you personally. Yeah. So I think that when you start, you make your focus sentence, you kind of are hinting at uh, what the data relationship is that you're trying to convey. So um, I think that when you're creating something, it's easy to just get stuck in the defaults like, oh, whatever data I have, you know, it's going to be a line chart or a bar chart. Yeah. But different charts are better at ch saying different things. Like if you are you saying something is changing over time, then you probably want to use a line chart. Are you comparing proportion of something? Then maybe you want to use a pie chart. Um, when you put it, your focus down in a sentence, you're probably going to say some words that hint at what kind of chart type that you need. And there, you know, it, hmm. that is a hard thing to do when you're first starting, knowing like what data works best for what chart type, but there's a lot of great resources out there. My personal favorite is um, the Financial Times Visual Vocabulary. And it's a really nice looking um, like poster. Po you can actually print it out. Um, and it has pictures of like 60 charts on it and they're all grouped by um, the data relationship. So like there's a group that shows correlation the best. There's a group that shows flow or change over time. So use your focus sentence and help that lead you to the group that is going to convey yeah. your data the best. Now, I, do, I don't proclaim to be a data visualization designer in the very least, which is ironic because I do work for a data visualization company. But I am always impressed by those who do have a strong aptitude towards this by just their sheer knowledge of like just different visualizations. And I swear it was not a uncommon occurrence when somebody would throw out a new chart type that I'm like, wait, that's not chart. You just made that up. And I'm like, oh, that is a real thing. Like this is just it's news to me. Um <laughs> In fact, well, I think there's a whole there's a whole website called Xenographics. Have you heard of that? No. <laughs> what is that? It's, uh, it, like people are constantly finding or creating new chart types, and you know, like they're mashing two different chart types together or creating a new way to visualize. So there's yeah, definitely exactly. not a finite way. <laughs> well, and I knew that, like for example, here at Domo, we've got a whole team that's in charge of making these different chart types. And when I heard that they support a couple hundred charts, I was like, come on, there's nothing more than a line in a bar chart. Wait, I can think of a pie as well. Okay, so there's three chart types, right? And <laughs> It was it was one day that I can't even remember the, the name of the chart that it was, but I had heard this chart type named once at a stand up or something like that. And then I read on it. Maybe it had been you, but somebody I was following on Twitter mentioned that same chart type. I was like, OK, there it is twice in a week. It's got to be real. <laughs> it's in the lexicon now. <laughs> and it's funny because I think. You know, as it comes to UX design, I always talk about how you have to have a UX playbook. You know, it doesn't mean that every single time you do a UX project, you do the exact same steps, but you need to be able to understand the value that a step could bring or a tool could bring or a, uh, a research tool could bring and then know when to deploy that step. And mm -hmm. it sounds like you go through the same processes. You've got a repertoire of understanding of the data visualization data visualization types mm -hmm. and then you understand when to deploy them is that is that accurate oh yeah totally and it definitely gets easier with time and it will probably feel hard when you first begin like i don't even know which one is going to work the best for this and it's totally common to try it in one chart and then you know change it and move it to a different chart type because yeah. um it's you know you're communicating with people just like with ux design and um, going with the default is might work sometimes, but um, trying something and testing it is is still definitely the way you need to go. So tell me maybe 
your top five or top 10 charts that you tend to come to more often than not? Um, what are those chart types called? Uh, I think, I mean, like line chart, bar chart. Um, I really like Sankey. It's kind of showing that was the one that was hot. It's hot right now. <laughs> I don't know. Okay, say it again. Sankey. Sankey. S yeah. Yeah. The first time I heard, I heard stanky and I was like, nope, that's not a chart type. And that's a, no, that's a dance. <laughs> sanky, yeah, exactly. Sanky chart. It's a hot one right now, huh? Yeah, yeah, because it's really nice at showing flows. It's kind of like broken up into pieces. Like this flows into um, this amount of this thing flows into this, and then that breaks up further. You know, it's a really great way to show. Um, also, survey data I have found. You know, like this amount of these people answered this way on this question, and then those people answered this way on another question. It really shows you a nice flow of um, proportion. Mm. Um, How, so, any other chart types that you think of? Yeah, um, let's see. Um, I also really like the waffle chart, which is a nice um, alter alternative to the pie chart or a tree map because it'll show you proportions, but it's a little bit more intuitive for people. So it's basically like a grid. So kind of like think like a waffle, like a grid. Yeah. And then yep. like say you have 100 um, squares in that waffle and you're saying, hey, 65% of whatever, whatever. And, you know, and then like six, uh, 65 of those um, squares will be colored in. So I like that one because yep. that one's very straightforward and also gives you an alternative to a pie chart when you don't want to use it. Now, this is going to take us down a total tangent, but just real quick, do you ever do anything with like uh, animated data visualizations? Yeah, I have. Um, I think that they work really well when you're trying to do tell a story over time. Um, and also, they're also really engaging um, on social media as yes. well. And, yes. Um, it's also really nice when you are trying to kind of work your audience through a complex chart, like maybe drawing a line and then, you know, having an annotation pop up and say, this thing rose this amount mm -hmm. and then have another line come go, go in, going the other way, going down and then pop up your annotation. So rather than just throwing a ton of information at your, at your reader, you're kind of like walk them through and kind of gives you yep. a way to narrate the chart without being there. So annotations, uh, yep. am, an, an, animation is great. So about 10 or 11 years ago, I was working at an internet marketing agency. And at that time, the thing that was super hot was infographics. Oh, uh -huh. And everybody and their dog wanted infographics <laughs> and infographics, obviously they have a place, um, but I've also seen them kind of evolve in how people do them and the animated like infographics, I still find really appealing. Mm -hmm. And so when you're talking about proportions, it quickly made me think of like some of those things that I've watched where it was like, uh, it was deaths during world war two. And it was done during this, this animation of showing proportions, uh, throughout the world. And it's just staggering once you could see it done this way. And it, it really drew out the emotion of like, okay, you see that you saw the deaths that happened in. Uh, you know, people from the Netherlands and from France, and those numbers are fairly low. And then you get to some of these other co countries that had much higher death rate. And it's just, oh, you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. It adds a I, lot of drama, doesn't it? It does. And it mm -hmm. just evokes this emotion. I think that's ultimately what you're going to try and do with this as mm -hmm. to make it something that's not just a, a pretty chart. You're still trying to uh, tell a story. You're still trying to get an uh, emotion across, I would assume, right? Yeah, kind of humanize the data. Because I mean, all day is about people, right? Right. People are involved in some way, pretty much on any metric. So yeah. if any way that you can remind people that these there's people behind this data, I think that's very a very valuable thing. Yeah, that yeah, makes a lot of sense. So I've got a lot of respect for what you guys do. Infographics was definitely not my thing. <laughs> I took a stab at one once upon a time. I'd be embarrassed to show you, but uh, <laughs> it was very rudimentary. <laughs> Anyways, I want to get to your, your last point. Uh, which uh, I believe you, you mentioned was mm -hmm. not to be afraid to use more than one chart. Yeah. And is that to convey some sort of message or why why would there be a need to use more than one chart? Yeah, I, I have found, I, I have just run up against this over and over again. And it's kind of something that I never would have thought about. Um, when you are, when you start data viz, um, you learn about the different encodings, like you can show the position of two variables and you can use color, you can use size, you can use pattern. Like you learn about all the different ways that you can encode data. Mm -hmm. So then the next a natural next step is that you have a data set and you you start assigning um, encodings to your, to your variables. 
like, oh, I can use position for this and then I can use color for this and then I can use size for this. And before you know it, you've created a puzzle. <laughs> and <laughs> then your audience is left sitting there like decoding your puzzle, yeah. because, like looking at the legend, like, okay, what was color again? Now what was size again? What was, and then like, they're just spend time decoding, yeah. decoding your chart rather than like understanding your main point. Mm -hmm. So I have found that once I start feeling like I am, um, kind of getting encode happy, like, like, okay, now I can encode this. Now I can encode that. I stop and think maybe what I'm trying to do would just be better in a whole separate chart. Um, mm. that way one chart can do one job and then the second chart can do the other job. You're trying to prove a point with this, these particular variables, like probably two or three variables. You're trying to prove a point, do that really well and let your reader absorb that, then take that other variable that you were trying to in further encode in that first chart, put it in another chart. Like for example, I recently had this mm -hmm. thing where um, the client wanted to show the aid that um, the US has sent to like the Middle East. Sure. And so um, the focus sentence was they wanted to show um, how much we have sent over there in this time period. So we did that and I just did bubbles over, over the countries you mm -hmm. know, to show the magnitude of what we have sent mm -hmm. over there, show the point great, but then they wanted to show kind of um, how much each year we have shown, we have given. So like, you know, in some, you'll see a spike in, you know, 2001, 2002, you know, we start sending more money over there. Um, and so then I thought, okay, well maybe I can um, add rings to my bubbles. So like you'll see more space in between, in between the rings. And then maybe I could color the rings so that they're, you know, um, darker if there was more during that year. And then I start thinking, okay, I am getting in code happy. This is going to, this is starting to become like, someone's going to look at this chart and they're going to see a whole bunch of different colors and circles in one spot. And they're going to have to be going back and forth between two different legends. And it's just going to be too much. So I kept the original chart with just the bubbles to show the magnitude in this time period. And then right below it, I had a bar chart that went year by year and showed the amount on the y-axis. So you could see 2001, 2002, 2003, and get an exact dollar amount. Yeah. And it was actually a stacked bar chart. So it was broken up by country and yeah. they actually worked together. They were, the top one was colored by country and the bottom one was colored by country. So you could see how they work together. So the top one, you could see the cumulative amount like total, this is what we've sent. And then the bottom you could see broken down by year. Yeah. So I think that that is a invaluable tool knowing when you are creating a puzzle and get, getting that feeling down, like that takes practice <laughs> realizing that you're, you're creating a puzzle, but just knowing that that is a possibility is very possible, is, is very, um, uh, powerful. Yeah. And, um, knowing when you need to possibly consider doing another chart. So I can't help but wonder the in the fact that you're calling this out is you know don't be afraid to use two charts. Mm -hmm. Do you think data viz designers look down on those who c couldn't pull it off with one chart or why is it important to have to call this out? I think you might I think I probably felt that as a newbie like you you should encode everything like this one chart should just do everything. Yeah. You know, okay. Maybe you're, you're, you're not um, talented enough. If you couldn't make that chart, you say could everything. find the chart that did everything. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So I feel like once I realized that, that there's really no shame in doing two charts and it actually makes more sense and better serves your reader. Um, uh, that was a really big changing point to me. And I think that is something that great data viz designers know that it's actually better to use more than one chart if you're trying to say more than one thing. So then how do we keep coming up with new chart types? If uh, you could probably break out those chart types and say like, yeah, but if you did this one and this one, it pretty much is that chart type. I think people are, I, I think they're finding um, new ways to show, I think that 
sometimes they are showing different relationships mm -hmm. that maybe another chart didn't show quite as well. Yeah. And then also people are showing, um, doing more custom visualizations, you know? So I yeah. don't think they are piling more onto them. I don't think that those charts are necessarily doing more work. Sometimes they are, but some usually they're not. They're just kind of showing it in a different way, a way that people haven't thought of before. Yeah, it makes total sense. You know, we're, we're about wrapped on time. But one of the things I really love about having this conversation is I can ask the most bogus questions. And I know that you're a data vis professional because you know how to wrap your mind out around what I'm trying to say. And so I really appreciate the insights that you're sharing because this is very, this is not my ground. This is not my, my area of expertise. And so I really appreciate you putting up with some of these questions that uh, I'm just genuinely interested in. Yeah, no, that's been great. So before we wrap, is there any, I, I am curious, I guess one, one last thing is what tools are you using to create your, your data visualizations? Yeah, I, um, mostly I use Tableau and that it has a free version, Tableau public. Um, yep, and it hurts my heart, but I get it. <laughs> you just mentioned Domo's number one competitor for database, oh, but that's sorry. fine. <laughs> <laughs> I'll edit that one out. Oh, I'm going to insert please, that you said please. Domo actually right there. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Keep going. Um, and I Tableau. Also, also like raw graphs dot io okay um r a w raw graphs. It's free, open source, and they have a lot of um. You can just paste your data right in there, and then you can also s export as SVG, which I really like because then I can bring it into Illustrator. Um, so using Il Adobe Illustrator is another one that I use a lot, and yep. um, I also use R where um it's a statistical um okay. software it's that's free also and there's a lot of data okay. viz resources if you look up ggplot for anybody that wants to um use that ggplot is a great package yeah it's not the only one but it's one of the most used ones is there i thought i recalled adobe was working on a a product for this yeah uh what is that called charticulator was that theirs? There's two of them. Data Illustrator, I think, and Articulator. Those were two kind of newish web-based ones yeah. that I have tested out. Um, Data Illustrator, I didn't couldn't really get into, you know, I I just haven't spent enough time looking at it. Charticulator was also hard for me to wrap my head around, but um I the thing I did like about that one was that it was easy to make really custom things. Like if you wanted to make a radar chart, like if you had a bar chart. And then you wanted it to um, like use Cartesian coordinates. It was really easy to hmm. turn that into a radar chart. Um, but yeah, those there's a lot of really great web free web based tools. Cool. Any other resources that you want to uh, mention for someone who's listening and they're just kind of getting their feet wet in data visualization? Um, I would definitely suggest joining the Data Visualization Society. It's new, only a couple months old, maybe six months by now. Um, they have a Slack channel, and it's so many amazing people in there and cool. resources. Um, and then also if you like hearing about different chart types and breaking down data visualization, my podcast, Data Viz Today, uh, datavistoday.com. Um, I'd love to have you join me there. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad you pugged that because uh, if we didn't, I was going to make sure that I did at the very end. Like I said, <laughs> your podcast has been up and running for about a year and a half now. So you've, there's, mm -hmm. there's some content there to be consumed. Yes, yes, it's very bingeable. Cool, very bingeable. <laughs> I wonder if people do that. Do they binge on podcasts? Um, it seems like people uh, binge on mine, and I binge on other people. So, see, I don't binge on podcast. I guess my favorite podcast I listen. I actually listen to a lot of the Joe Rogan podcast, and that one's hard to binge because that's too hard to binge. <laughs> it's two and a half hours, hours long. <laughs> well, the thing is, my episodes are like usually under 15 right. minutes. So I think that's why it, it makes it a little bit more bingeable. That's awesome. Allie, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast. This has been uh, really ex exciting for me just to, to, again, to learn more about this world. So I appreciate it. Thanks, Dylan. That is a wrap for design today. <laughs> and uh, we'll get more coming out next week. Thanks for listening in on this episode. If you found any value in what you just heard, then go ahead and subscribe and be notified when future episodes go live. If this is your first experience with design today, then you're in luck also because there are over 50 other episodes for you to go back and listen to. The video version can be found on YouTube and the podcast format can be found on any of your favorite podcasting platforms. Your subscribes, likes, shares, and comments really go a long way in helping design today gain exposure. So thank you very much.